Hi, everybody. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. We hope you had a lovely weekend and hope you can hear me okay. Um, thank you for joining us this Sunday evening for the first OAUK Health and Wellbeing webinar of 2024. That is jo um, jointly organized by OAUK and JHI. Uh, my name is Punam Shah and I, along with Rajvi Punathar, are co-trustees of the Health and Wellbeing Portfolio for OA UK. And it's a great privilege for me today to start the webinar series with a topic that closely resonates with many of us. The topic for today is body image, disordered eating, and eating disorders. And the webinar today coincides quite nicely with um, Eating Disorders Awareness Week, which starts from tomorrow all the way until the end of the week. So it gives me great pleasure today to introduce our speaker, who is a young Oshwal, Rina Gudka. Rina, welcome to the webinar. In addition, we also have one of Rina's family member, uh, Jyoti Ben Nodia, who is Rina's aunt. And um, she is here in a supporting role for the support that she provides Rina and her family. Alongside, we have Rajvi Punathar that you can see. She is co-chairing the webinar today with me. So a little bit of an introduction to Rina. Rina is a civil servant at His Majesty's tri uh, Treasury and a co-founder of the Civil Service Eating Disorders Network, the first of its kind. Um, Rina herself has been impacted by anorexia since her teen years and is passionate about reducing the stigma around eating disorders, particularly in the South Asian communities. Uh, she received a British Empire Medal in 2023, uh, in the 2023 New Year's Honours List for, for her voluntary services to civil servants affected by eating disorders. I just want to also mention that she's one of the youngest Oshwals to receive this award. Rina, welcome and congratulations on this award. It's a massive achievement and a good recognition. Um, so I, for the webinar today, I'm just going to, going to introduce the agenda. It's split into four sections. Is we're going to start by an introduction given by Rina to eating disorders and some of the common disorders that face the South Asian communities, the common misconceptions about them and how these issues actually impact us and what we can do to support each other. We will then hear from Rina about her own experiences with eating disorders, the pressure, I think this is something we all kind of uh, relate to in some way or form, the pressure that the South Asians often feel to look a certain way and navigate cultural spaces which often revolve around food. After that, there's gonna be a panel discussion with Rina and Jyotibin, and following which, we will open it up for Q&A from the audience. So OAUK is committed to providing a safe space for our audience and for our members, our panel members. And therefore we welcome questions anonymously in the link that's going to be shared with you shortly on YouTube and on Zoom. In our commitment for a safe space, there are some ground rules as well that Rina will cover. And we ask everybody to respect these rules, please. So without any further ado, Rina, over to you. Thanks, Ponam, for the introduction um, and for having me today. Um, and thanks for everyone for joining. Um, I actually just got back from India for a few hours ago. So if I cry today, it's probably because I'm jet lagged. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, and Ponam, do let me know if there are any issues. We can see it. You can, yeah. There you That's go. Perfect. Um, so I'm just going to do a, a quick, very high level um, introduction to what body image is, disordered eating and eating disorders. Um, and to start, I'll just go through those ground rules, um, those guidelines that um, have been shared in the chat. Um, and the reason why we share these is to keep everyone safe. Um, these are quite difficult things to talk about and we don't want to trigger anyone um, or give anyone um, ideas to do harmful things. Um, so if everyone could kind of respect um, some of these, uh, all of these rules, that would be really helpful. So the first one is uh, we want to avoid uh, mention of uh, units of measurement. 
Um, so that includes calories, uh, BMI numbers, uh, kilos or pounds. Um, that's because people can find those numbers to be quite distressing or remind them of a particular time when they attached um, value or fixation to those numbers. Um, so for instance, saying something like, I used to weigh X amount, um, um, or I used to weigh, um, I, I lost X amount of weight, that would probably be quite um, triggering. Um, but saying something more generally, such as I have gained weight or I was overweight, um, that is okay. So just try to avoid using specific numbers. Um, similarly, we wanna avoid using specific details around harmful behavior. Um, so for instance, um, saying something like, I struggle with restriction or I used to be in a cycle of binging and purging is okay to say because it's quite general, but giving a uh, detail around specific methods that you might have engaged in or someone else might have engaged in is what we want to avoid. Um, the last thing is that um, everyone who's attending um, is kind of pro-recovery, pro-mental health, good mental health. Um, we're here because we want to get better and encourage each other um, in a positive way. So we don't want to talk about the perceived benefits of eating disorders because that can be really harmful for someone's uh, recovery. So uh, here are some of the key differences between body image, disordered eating and eating disorders, because not a lot of people know that these are different things. Everyone has body image, whether it's positive, negative or neutral. Um, it's very normal to feel differently about your body every single day and also differently about different parts of your body. Uh, body image isn't just something um, that only people have negative experiences of. You can absolutely have a positive experience or even a neutral experience of body image. Um, then you have non-disordered eating. So that's when someone might consume food when they're hungry and they'll feel like they are able to stop once they feel full. Uh, but then there's disordered eating, uh, which at some point in everyone's life we will all experience. Um, so for instance, if you've had a really stressful day at work, um, you come home and to make yourself feel better, you might eat a lot of chocolate. That's probably something that a lot of us have done at some point. Um, you might eat out of boredom, um, you might eat to cover up your emotions or do the opposite and not eat, you might restrict. Um, so that would be disordered eating. The difference between disordered eating and eating disorders is the severity and the frequency. So someone with an eating disorder will engage in a lot of the same behaviors, uh, a lot of the same disordered eating behaviors. Uh, but for that person to be diagnosed with an eating disorder, it depends on uh, the frequency and the severity of those behaviors. Eating disorders are absolutely serious mental health illnesses um, and uh, disordered eating is also very problematic and should be taken just as seriously. Um, so not a lot of people know that eating disorders affect a significant number of people in the UK. So we're looking at around 1.25 million people um, across, the, across the UK. Um, but that doesn't include the number of people who are indirectly impacted. So when I say indirectly impacted, I'm talking about people who are in supporting roles, uh, parents, uh, siblings, friends, aunts, uncles, uh, even colleagues at work, uh, because the amount of kind of stress that they'll take on to support the person with an eating disorder can have a knock-on impact on their own well-being, and we want to make sure that those people are also looked after. They're not diets or lifestyle choices. Like I said, they're very serious illnesses, um, and actually they have the highest mortality rates amongst psychiatric disorders. A lot of people associate um, eating disorders such as anorexia as uh, fad diets. They associate it with um, the size zero debate. But actually, these are very serious mental health issues. And they're not actually about food and exercise themselves. Um, those are the symptoms that present themselves. Eating disorders quite often cover up um, deep rooted underlying issues. It could be trauma that you suffered from as a child or even as an adult. Um, and you might not even be aware of some of those underlying issues yet, or you might be aware but haven't worked through those issues. Um, but the food and uh, exercise behaviours are actually symptoms um, and uh, ways to cope with underlying issues. Uh, so we wanted to do a bit of a poll um, to get an understanding of um, where people are at on their level of knowledge of eating disorders. Um, so you'll see a poll come up on your screens. Um, and the first one is about uh, which type of eating disorder you think is most common. 
So there are four options. There's anorexia, there's binge eating disorder, there's bulimia, and there's the last one, other specified food or eating disorder. Um, so I'll give everyone around 20 seconds um, to, to say which eating disorder they think is most common. Um, and later on, um, after people have put their options in, um, I'll give you a sense of whether you're kind of on track or not. Um, so I'll let Poonam or Rajvi tell me what the results look like in about 10 seconds, if that's all right. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, very similar on YouTube and on uh, um, Zoom. So do you want the results now? Yes, please. Okay. So on Zoom, we have about 33% saying anorexia and 56% saying uh, binge eating dis uh, disorder. Um, nobody said bulimia and 11% think it's offset, offsped. And on YouTube, it's equal between anorexia and binge eating disorder. Thank you. Okay, no problem. So on, your, on the screen now, you'll see um, the results, um, kind of the actual results. Uh, you'll see that anorexia is actually one of the least common amongst eating disorders. Um, it's probably the one that most people have heard of. Uh, you'll read about it in the news a lot. It was uh, kind of on the tip of everyone's tongue when the size zero, size zero debate uh, was talked about a lot. Um, actually, uh, the most common eating disorder is other specified food or eating disorder, which is probably one that not a lot of people have uh, heard about. What it means is that uh, someone's symptoms don't kind of quote unquote neatly fit into one diagnostic criteria. It's not a less serious eating disorder at all, um, but it, in some ways it's a bit of a, a catch-all if uh, you, your symptoms don't fit neatly into anorexia, bulimia or binge eating disorder. Um, binge eating disorder, which you can see is the second most uh, common eating disorder, uh, that's basically when someone consumes a large amount of food in a very short period of time uh, they feel like they don't have control over it. Um, and what separates that from bulimia, which is the next one down, is that someone with bulimia will also engage in um, binging, which is eating a large amount of food in a short period of time. Uh, but then they'll kind of compensate for that uh, by purging. Um, that usually includes things like fasting or restricting their food. Um, they might ex um, exercise uh, to control their weight. Um, anorexia, uh, the one that most people would have heard of, is when someone will attempt to keep their weight as low as possible uh, by restricting their food. Um, they might also engage in uh, purging uh, or obsessive exercise. The last one, which wasn't on the poll, but is this year's um, theme for Eating Disorders Awareness Week, is Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder. Um, that is sometimes described as food phobia. Um, so someone who has that disorder might be scared of certain types of food. Um, they might worry that it's going to make them sick or give them some sort of anxiety. Um, they might also avoid certain types of food because of sensory issues. So the taste, the smell um, or the appearance. Um, and that particular disorder is usually less about low self-esteem and body image. Um, you then have a few other types of eating disorders uh, which aren't talked about as much. Um, they're a lot less common, but just as serious, uh, which I won't go through today, um, but I've listed them out. So you've got orthorexia, um, you have diabulimia, which is also known as type 1 diabetes with an eating disorder. There's PICA and there's also rumination disorder. Um, it's quite uh, common for uh, people to see eating disorders as a spectrum. So some people move in and out of various diagnoses throughout their lives. That was def definitely the case with me. Um, I've had an eating disorder for about 16 years, but at various points it's been anorexia. It hasn't been anorexia throughout. Um, so uh, some people will find a diagnosis quite helpful. Um, it kind of encourages them to get the help that they need. Um, but for other people, a diagnosis can actually not be very helpful. Um, it might be um, it might they might feel competitive. They might feel like their eating disorder is better than another um, or more serious, um, and that can actually fuel someone's eating disorder. I remember when I was first diagnosed with anorexia, I there was a part of me that actually felt uh, validated in a really negative way. Um, I felt like I had achieved something, um, and it wasn't until I started getting help that I realized that it was not something that I should be celebrating. 
Um, there are quite a few different symptoms depending on the eating disorder, um, but on the on the screen you'll see uh, just a summary of some of the ones that uh, a lot of people experience. So some of the mental symptoms will include anxiety, depression, having low self-esteem, um, being quite perfectionistic, which is very common amongst people with eating disorders. Uh, they might be very detail-orientated. Um, some of the physical symptoms will depend a lot on uh, the kind of eating disorder that person has, uh, whether they've kind of gained weight or lost weight. Um, they might feel cold a lot. Um, they might feel quite dizzy, um, have headaches on a regular basis. Um, they might have calluses on the back of their hands. Um, and some of the behavioral symptoms will include uh, talking a lot about food, being quite obsessed with um, restricting food or um, consuming food, exercise. Um, social situations can be quite difficult for someone with an eating disorder. Um, they might outright avoid social situations or they might experience a lot of anxiety um, around social situations. So the next uh, poll uh, that you'll see come up on the screen is a true or false question. Uh, so I'll give everyone about 20 seconds to answer this one. This is uh, eating disorders mostly affect young women. Is that true or false? Um, so I'll give everyone uh, about 15 seconds left. Um, and if Bunim, you would, if you wouldn't mind um, just letting you know what the responses look like. Sure, they're just coming in as we speak. Okay, so on uh, Zoom, we have about 67% saying it's true um, and uh, the, uh, the, the rest saying false. And on YouTube, um, we're looking at, um, one second, let me just get it up, <laughs> the other way around, 67% saying false, 70% saying false on YouTube and about 30% saying true. Okay, thank you, Bonham. So the answer is technically true, according to the stats that we have, uh, but there are lots of caveats to that. Um, so the main thing that I really want to get across here is that anyone can develop an eating disorder, regardless of their identity. Um, eating disorders don't discriminate in that sense. Um, so whilst statistics that we currently have show that young women um, uh, are more likely to develop eating disorders that doesn't mean that no one else can develop an eating disorder or it shouldn't be taken as seriously um, there is a stereotype out there that eating disorders exclusively affect young white uh, women uh, who are heterosexual able-bodied um, and likely middle class um, and there's also this assumption that you can see when someone has an eating disorder uh, because there's this uh, misconception that it's only it's only people who have anorexia, people who are underweight. But that's absolutely not true. Um, it's thought around it's thought that around 25 percent of people who have eating disorders are male. But actually, that percentage is likely to be a lot higher because of the stigma that people face when talking about their experiences, getting help and being diagnosed. So there are probably a lot of people out there not being diagnosed and getting the help that they need. And the same goes for people from ethnic minority backgrounds. The numbers are probably a lot higher um, than what we know. Um, and some studies say that actually people with um, people from ethnic minority groups are just as likely, if not more likely, to develop eating disorders than their white counterparts. Um, someone from um, a high age group can absolutely develop an eating disorder. And actually, we saw those numbers um, increase quite a bit during the pandemic. Um, and stigma generally, as I mentioned, can be really, really harmful in preventing someone from opening up about what they're experiencing and getting the help that they need. Um, and that's definitely the case with uh, men. It's definitely the case with ethnic minority groups um, and definitely the case with LGBT groups as well. Um, so when I was thinking about the kind of top four or five things that I would want to suggest to someone uh, who may be experiencing any one of those issues that I've highlighted. Um, I was really struggling to narrow it down to four or five, um, but I've put a few up on the screen, uh, which hopefully some people will find helpful. Um, the first one, which I think is the most important one, is getting help. Um, getting in contact with your GP or mental health professional could be through your employer, your university, um, through your school, um, if you're still at school, 
or visiting a charity website such as uh, BEAT, which is the UK's leading eating disorders charity. They are really, really brilliant. They offer um, lots of support groups um, for specific eating disorders. They have one-to-one -one web chats as well. Um, and they also have a directory um, on how to access professional help. So the most important thing you could do for yourself is get professional help. Um, the second thing is, if you feel comfortable, and understandably you might not, um, try to confide in someone um, about what you're experiencing. But think about what kind of support you might want. Um, people operate in different ways and different things will work for um, each person. Um, if you're not sure about what kind of support you would want, uh, do visit the BEAT website because they have lots of options out there. Um, and you might, before having that conversation with someone, you might find it helpful to make notes um, so that the conversation doesn't feel overwhelming and take you by surprise. Um, these days, you might see a lot of uh, calorie information on menus. Um, it's now um, a legal requirement for employers, which uh, if they have more than 250 employees to have calorie information on their menus, and that can be really, really triggering for someone with an eating disorder. Um, BEAT have... Uh, a lot of great guidelines on how to manage the anxiety uh, that you might experience um, if you do see calorie information. So I would really recommend visiting their website um, so that you feel um, a bit more prepared and less anxious. Um, the next one is about setting boundaries with people around you. Um, and this is something that I've learned a lot uh, about in therapy. Um, people might use uh, certain trigger words or phrases that you find uh, really, really difficult to manage. Uh, but being firm about uh, what your boundaries are, what you do and don't feel comfortable with is really, really important and can go a very long way in helping your recovery. And the last one is uh, just remember that you're not alone. You'll be surprised by how many people suffer from negative body image, disordered eating and eating disorders. We just don't talk about those things enough. So you feel quite often that you're alone in this and you're kind of stuck. Um, but actually there are a lot of people out there going through the same thing and there is a lot of support available. Uh, what you're going through is absolutely temporary and I promise you it will pass. Um, and lastly, uh, but not least important, I wanted to go through some um, tips on how to support someone that you care about if you're in a supporting role. Um, so the most important thing you could do is educate yourself, uh, read books, listen to podcasts, uh, visit uh, charity websites like Beat, um, talk to people, ask questions. There's no such thing as a stupid question because the better informed you are, the more likely you'll be able to help someone that you're worried about. Um, when it comes to supporting people that you're worried about, ask that person what kind of support they would want. Don't assume the kind of support that they would want. Don't um, assume that they have a specific eating disorder or an eating disorder at all. Don't make those assumptions um, and actually listen to what they have to say. Um, the third one is about making comments about someone's appearance. Um, so this is about uh, before someone um, is in recovery, during their recovery or even after their recovery. Never make comments about that person's appearance regardless of how well intended they may be you might mean well but commenting on someone's weight size or shape is really not helpful um, and it can actually um, be very very triggering even if you said something like oh you look healthier or you look well compared to before that can quite easily be misinterpreted um, by that person and make the problem worse focus on how that person is feeling rather than how they look um, be an ally. Uh, so if you hear inappropriate comments, uh, don't be afraid to challenge um, the person who um, is making those comments um, and stand up for the person that you're worried about. And last but not least, don't forget to look after yourself. Um, this uh, analogy that a friend gave me a few years ago has really stuck with me. And it's that when you're on a plane, um, the flight attendants will tell you that in case of an emergency, you should put your mask, oxygen mask on first before helping others. And you should see well-being, mental health in the same way. So if you look after yourself, you'll be in a better position to look after the person that you're worried about. Um, and that's really important for people who are in supporting positions when it comes to any kind of meta mental health issue, but in this case, eating disorders. Um, and that's it. So back to you, Punam. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rina. I think that I, I did not appreciate just how much there is, how many disorders there are. 
and how it affects people in so many different ways and how sometimes we don't know where to reach out to. So I think the information that you've given to us is so, so useful. Um, and hopefully it can, you know, help guide people uh, as to where to reach out to. Um, so you mentioned briefly at the beginning about your own journey and uh, your the impact that this has had on you. Um, would you please share your journey with anorexia, please, and also eating disorders in general? Sure. Um, so I developed anorexia when I was a teenager. Um, I think it started around the time that I uh, became a teenager and started going through puberty. I noticed my body was changing um, and I didn't like it. Um, it was also around the time that I developed a skin condition called vitiligo, uh, which is where your pigmentation changes. And I became really, really self-conscious about the way that I looked. And I guess restricting my food intake and over-exercising was my way of trying to reserve, reverse those changes that I saw. And I guess in some ways stop myself from becoming an adult um, as I was going through puberty. Um, and it was not long after I graduated from university that I found myself recovering slowly but surely. And one of the reasons was because I, I sought out help. I did go through therapy as a teenager uh, through the NHS, but to be honest, I don't think it helped because I didn't want help. I didn't want to get better. Um, and that changed when I was at university. Um, so I was getting better slowly but surely. And then in 2019, I relapsed back into anorexia. Um, and this just coincidentally happened to be around the same time that I was launching this eating disorders network uh, through my job uh, with some of my colleagues. And it ended up being the most wonderful thing that could have happened for me because not only was I able to help other people and share my experiences, but it also helped me too because all of a sudden I had this support network. Um, I found all these people that... Um, understood what I was going through and I, I didn't have that up until that point um, and just by having these kind of webinars through the civil service this is my first external one but being able to do those through the civil service meant that I was sharing my experiences in a way that I previously didn't feel like I could because I felt so much stigma and shame and now I feel like I can, can talk to a stranger about it and not really care about what they think they judge me, then the problem is with them and not with me. But that I definitely didn't feel that way five years ago. Um, there were kind of two things that really stuck out for me um, that probably made the eating disorder fester. And I still have an eating disorder. Um, I'm, I'm in recovery, but I, I still have a very long way to go. Um, one was uh, something that probably revolves around South Asian culture quite a bit. And that's worrying about what other people will think. Um, there are some obviously really amazing aspects of our culture, which I absolutely love, but there are also some really difficult parts of our culture that I think we collectively need to do a lot better on. Um, there's a lot of gossiping in our communities. It doesn't take a lot to be named and shamed, even for something that's considered normal by Western standards. Um, so growing up, I always felt the strong urge to be perfect in every sense of the word, whether it was to do with exams at school, performing well in dance or going getting into a good university. Um, so uh, not only was getting anything less than an A star in an exam petrifying because of the thought of what will other people think, uh, but also what would other people think if I was overweight? What, what would people think if I didn't have fair skin or if I didn't have long, thick hair? Um, and that ties into the shame that you expect to feel if someone knew that you had a mental health illness. So the thought of someone finding out that I had that I was in therapy as a teenager or knowing that I had anorexia was so, so scary. Um, it was this dirty secret that only my immediate family and best friends could know about. Um, the other thing is the, the pressure to live life to serve others. Um, and I think that's quite a big thing in um, South Asian communities. So getting good grades to make your parents happy, getting a good job so your chances of finding a suitable partner increase. Um, and in that process of making sure that everything you do serves others well, you forget about yourself. Um, so for the longest time, I didn't have a sense of self. I didn't give myself any kind of importance and I would have been quite willing and ready to put my own health on the back burner so that I could continue doing things for other people. And it was actually only when the first COVID lockdown started back in 
what was it 2020 um that all of a sudden I had all this time to start looking after myself and I didn't have any excuses for not doing it so simple things like skincare um or saying no to people and not feeling guilty about saying no um those are things that I had to learn how to do um a few years ago and now I feel like I have a sense of self but that definitely wasn't the case before COVID um Having an eating disorder has or is, to be completely honest, absolute hell. Um, I've never been an adult without an eating disorder, so I, I don't really know any different. But at my lowest, I I would say I didn't want to be alive anymore. And at my highest, I simply didn't mind being alive. Uh, it was only until a few years ago that I actually truly started living, um, at least for myself anyway. Um so over the last few years, I've been in recovery. Um, still have a very long way to go. I'm by no means recovered. Um, I've been in therapy for several years. I've been on medication and I have this wonderful uh, support system um, through my job, through this network where we run these kinds of webinars. We have one-to-one -one support sessions. We have monthly support sessions for anyone and everyone as well in kind of group settings. Uh, we have a toolkit, uh, which is, I think, at this point, 45 pages, which have, which has absolutely everything you need to know about eating disorders and how to support people. Um, and uh, we run panel sessions as well um, to raise awareness. Um, and the, one of the reasons why I wanted to co-launch that network and also do this webinar is because I don't want other people to experience what I've experienced. Um, and um, it also helps me in my own recovery journey as well, because like I said, I don't feel the shame about talking about eating disorders like I used to. And that's been a massive part of my recovery. Um, yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of what you've said has resonated so much in terms of what we see growing up. You know, that fear that of, uh, of being judged um, in, in the community and things like that. And it's admirable to see where from where you started to where you've got, gotten to. Yes, the journey continues, but to be able to come and speak to that very community as well is a big step. So well done to that. There's so many questions I have for you around all of those things that you've talked about. And I'm sure the audience has a lot of questions, especially around the social aspects, you know, and body image and all of us trying to fit in, you know, the... Um, making sure that we don't cross our lines and things. But we'll come to those. Uh, and one of the things you touched upon was a support system that you have uh, within your workplace, the, um, the network that you've uh, gathered. And one of the support systems that you also have is your aunt, uh, Jyoti Ben Dodia, who's joining us today. Uh, Jyoti Ben, welcome. Thanks, hi. Uh, hi. So welcome to the sh uh, sem webinar today. Um, I think as Rina has talked about, you know, that support system is just so important for people. Um, so we're going to have this panel discussion and there are some questions that ha have been prepared that we will ask both of you. Um, both of you, know, as Rina, who's somebody who's impacted by the disorder, but also Jyoti Ben, you in that support system as well for her and for her family. So before we start uh, with the panel discussion, I'd like uh, Jyoti Ben... Uh, for you to just say a few words about yourself, please. And then Rajvi and I will start the panel discussion with you. Sure. So I'm Jyoti, as uh, as you say, uh, Rina's aunt. Um, so Rina is my brother's daughter. And my role has mainly been in a kind of supportive role for the family. Uh, and then in more later years uh, with Rina, we're very lucky that we're a close-knit family. So we have, you know, discussions all the time. If there's any issues, everyone rallies around. Um, so it, it's, it is a very um, nice environment. Um, and I guess when this first started happening, it was quite strange and new and unknown territory for all of us. So trying to understand things um, was not easy. And all those years ago, there wasn't as much information as there is now. So that was that made it even um, even more difficult. Um, but yes, that that's the kind of uh, role I've played. We've supported each other, I would mm -hmm. say, rather than it being a one-way thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
That's very true. I think that is really, really true. And it's uh, it goes both ways, right? Uh, you have that close-knit family that you're able to help each other. You've been able to be there for the family and also they've been able to rely on you. Um, so we'll start off with the first question. Um, so Rina, I think I'd like to ask you this question is, um, what do you think are the reasons for the lack of understanding or insight into the experiences of body image in South Asian communities? Um, I mean, I think a lot of people have different answers to this. I think for me, there are probably two things that stick out. Um, one is the stigma around mental health generally, which is we've come a long way in the South Asian community. I think there are a lot more conversations about mental health and the stigma is reducing slowly but surely. But I think it is still um, a big problem. Um, so when there's so much stigma around mental health in general, it's not a surprise that there's going to be stigma around eating disorders, disordered eating, negative body image. There is a lack of understanding and um, you know, if if you see a child not eating, um, you, your first thought isn't going to be this person might have a very, this child might have a very serious eating disorder. Um, it's going to be, no, just eat, you know, just kind of force feeding that person. And that's just ingrained, in, ingrained into our communities. Um, it's kind of, it's not seen as uh, an issue. It's just, you, you see that child is just being a bit stubborn. Um, and kicking up a fuss over nothing when actually th there could be something quite serious happening. Um, I think the other thing is uh, constantly worrying about what other people will think um, and uh, putting pressure on ourselves to please other people. Um, so like I mentioned when I was talking about my own story, um, having a certain body type, having long uh, hair or fair skin, um, and when you don't have those things, worrying about what other people will say um, and how they'll perceive you. Um, and I think because of that preoccupation, we haven't taken a second to think about why we actually have those thoughts and feelings. Why do we put pressure on ourselves to look a certain way um, in the first place? Um, and if we don't have that understanding, being able to recognize or understand an eating disorder is almost impossible. Um, so I think there's a, a massive role for us to play in kind of stopping and thinking about uh, why do we aspire to, to look a certain way at all? Mm -hmm. um, is it because of Western beauty standards? Um, is it because um, of something else happening within our, within our communities? Um, yeah. Perfect. No, I think that's a lot of food for thought there. Um, Rajvi, can you? Would you like yes. to take the next question? I I have a question now for Jyoti. Um, for you, what have be, what have been the key differences between being a family member to a child with an eating disorder and an adult yourself with an eating disorder? So I think um, when they're a child, first of all, when when you hear of somebody with such an issue, your first reaction is you want to fix it. You want them to be happy. And to understand that, you need to understand what the issue is and you want to understand the reason. Mm. When they're a child or a teen, they can't necessarily articulate what the issues are or why it's happening or express themselves. So it makes it doubly difficult. Mm. Um, so I think that became, you know, that quite quite a, um, a difficult situation and then probably puts um, strains on relationships because, you know, the different people have different approaches. Um, and then when they're an adult, some aspects become easier because they may be able to understand themselves better. They may be able to express what is going on or what might be occurring, possibly more open to seeking help from professionals or confiding in people. Whereas I think when they're a child or a teen, um, it, it is especially difficult. And I would say early teen is the most difficult because they're going through a huge amount of change mm. um, personally. And, you know, they kind of want to fit in, but also be different. There's so many things going on with the body, with the hormones, um, with friendships with family relationships that, um, that 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 is a difficult stage as it is and then you throw in this and it's an added 
you know, makes makes it much, much more of an issue. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. So now I have a question for both of you. Um, and this is around something that Rina talked about, you know, um, the perception in the community. So negative body image is particularly relevant in South Asian communities. Um, and also because of the role that food plays in our culture. So when there are large gatherings, you know, there's usually a lot of food involved. A lot of people are encouraged to socialize and to eat. Um, however, it's also the place where family members and friends will comment on various aspects of one's life, right? Um, like the physical appearance of a person. If somebody, you know, with comments like, okay, if you gain weight, nobody's going to marry you. Um, how do you navigate these cultural spaces and you know that would that can trigger body image issues in people you want to go first rena yeah sure um i mean from a, uh um just my perspective i know that some, some it's something that i've really really struggled with um just the constant body shaming and the pressure to eat um it's almost disrespectful to go to someone's house and not have something that they've offered you um you're almost force fed and that person will be offended if you don't eat um but like you said Bonham, if you do god forbid you do gain a bit of weight the kind of the the shaming is um people don't really hold back um in that sense and our culture uh, in our culture everything revolves around food you go to a happy occasion there's food you go to a sad occasion there's also food um, and so you're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. Um, in terms of how to navigate those cultural spaces, um, I mean, it, it's something that I've really struggled with and it's taken me a while to figure out what works for me um, and what helps me. Um, and that will be different for every person. I think having allies is really, really important. Um, having people that will stick up for you when you feel like you're, on, you're unable to stick up for yourself. Um, especially if you're impacted by something like an eating disorder, um, knowing that someone has your back and will kind of chime in when needed um, is really important. But of course, you need to uh, work up to a place where you're able to um, stand up for yourself as well. But having allies is really, really important. Um, I do remember a particular situation when I was a lot younger and we were at um, a family gathering, which my aunt uh, was at, and I wasn't really eating much at that age um, when I was a teenager and I kept being pestered about eating something everyone else was eating. And I was really, um, I felt very stuck in that situation because I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what excuse to give. I didn't want to eat, but I felt so much pressure to eat. And I remember my aunt chiming in and saying, oh, she had a big breakfast, so she probably eat a bit later. And just that one sentence uh, kind of meant that person backed off straight away. Um, and just saying something really simple like that and being an ally can be so, so powerful um, and really take the heat off that person. Um, so I think having allies is uh, so, so valuable. Um, yeah. It's interesting you say that, Rina, because I don't even remember that occasion um, or, or what happened. But, um, yeah, and, and the, you can picture the scene, you know, it's not necessarily malicious intent. It's some well-meaning relative or friend and they want you to eat or eat more. Um, and, you know, <laughs> they're, they're just, it's probably coming from a good place, but it's just the lack of awareness because you don't know everyone's situation. They may be going through something like this and um, it can be triggering. So yeah, over, over time, I think uh, we've all had to learn, me being part of the older generation and uh, poss possibly guilty of that in the past, I would say. Thank you. Um, okay. Um yeah, I, I have a, a, a question. So um, uh, it, it's to Rina, um, Jyoti, chime in if you have anything to add. So how do you stand up against body shaming? And B, how would you look after your mental health? Um, 
So I think uh, in terms of standing up against body shaming, like I said, being an ally or having allies is really important. Um, I think something that I've had to learn a lot about through therapy um, in terms of me standing up for myself is setting boundaries with people, which is a really difficult thing. Um, but I, I mean, for me personally, it's it's played a significant role in my own recovery. Um, if someone is saying, if someone uses triggering words or phrases, being able to say to that person, please, can you not because of X, Y, Z, that is really, really important. And trying to explain to them why it makes you feel a certain way um, will hopefully uh, encourage them to stop. Um, that's not always easy uh, because not everyone will understand, not everyone will appreciate what you're going through. And some people will just outright disagree. They will think that what they're saying is fine. Um, but reiterating those boundaries is really important. It's something that I've had to do uh, in certain aspects of my life. Um, and it's something I've complained to my therapist a lot about because it's exhausting having to reiterate those boundaries uh, with people who just don't seem to get it or respect those boundaries. Um, but my therapist has always said, if it's, if it's so important um, that it helps your recovery, then it's something that's worth doing. In some situations, it's worth kind of stepping away from those relationships if they if you find them too triggering. You know, it's not worth uh, forcing yourself to continue to be in that relationship because your well-being should come first. But I think setting those boundaries, generally speaking, is really really important. Um, that no, not only will help you to stand up against body shaming, but in turn helps you to look after your own mental health. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I, th I th and I think just. Uh, uh, the point I made earlier about having allies or being an ally is really, really important mm -hmm. um, because you don't have to tolerate comments. Um, I think quite often we choose to because we want to be respectful, especially of people who are older than us. That's a massive thing in our communities. Um, and you kind of feel like you have to bite your tongue. But if it's at the cost of your own well-being, is it really worth it? It's not worth it. Yeah. It's true. Um, on the other side of the coin, if I put the up, you know, from my perspective or from parents and um, family members' perspective, it is a really difficult situation or was um, in terms of you feel like you're treading on eggshells. Yeah. You're scared of saying the wrong thing. You don't want to do more harm than good. But at the same time, you cannot stay silent or say nothing because then you're not showing support. So it's a really fine balance um, and education, looking, you know, looking for information, Re proper sources of information and and talking to the person in question um to understand them better i think those are the the things that probably help mm -hmm. yeah and i think that some of the questions that are coming through from the audience are along those lines you know um how, how can you support and how do you when you're in that situation of a supporting role um so we can take those uh, we can go into more details when they um, when we approach those questions as well. Uh, Jyotiben, I have a question for you. Um, were there any noticeable differences between the impacts of what was happening uh, on female family members and male members of the family? Um, this is a tricky one, you know, without kind of making a really gross generalization, inevitably there were some differences in approach. The male members, I would say, on the whole, okay, this isn't black and white, but on the whole, um, the approach was let's fix it, let's fix it fast. Um, and the female approach tended to be more gentler persuasion. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I would say it's not just even just gender based, it's personality based. So, different, you know, if we leave male and female out of it, people with different personalities will approach the situation differently. Um, so yeah, that, that's my experience. Um, it's, a, it's a learning curve, right? In hindsight, we all can think of things that we would have done differently, um, but hindsight is a wonderful thing, as they say. Absolutely. Um, and I think sort of that, that sort of brings me to the this next question, Jyoti Ben. So just carrying on from what you were just saying, that if you could go back in time to when Rena was first diagnosed, um, and you could give yourself a message, what would it be? Um, I would say that 
the best thing is to be patient and be gentle, gentle with the person, patient with yourself, uh, patient with the, the person in question as well. Take things one step at a time. Don't be in a rush to get to the fix because that's all you're thinking at that time. But it isn't a fix. It is a journey over time. Mm. Um, I would say talk it over with you know, friends, family, professionals, whoever you think is going to help you get information from um, good sources, you know, don't Google things because you're not going to necessarily get the good information. It, it, it can be very dangerous. Okay. Um, and the last thing I would say is um, look after your own self. I think Rena mentioned this in, in her presentation, but I, I was thinking about all of this before this webinar came. And um, one of the, the things I think is really important is to look after yourself, do things that make you whole because you do feel broken at the time, make you whole so that then you can be wholly there for, for the person that you can start afresh and, and be strong for them um, because otherwise you, you're no good to anyone. No, not very good advice there. And so we come, we'll take this as a, like the last question for the panel. Um, so Verena, this one is for you and uh, focusing specifically on the South Asian community. So if someone suspects that a child, a teen or an early adult is being impacted by an uh, this an eating disorder, how should they appropriately initiate or approach a conversation with them or their parent or their guardian? Um, so some of this will depend on the age of the person that you're worried about. Um, so if they are legally still a child, then your approach will need to be different to than if that person is legally an adult. Um, if they're legally a child, you may need to approach that person's parents first, for instance, or their guardian. Um, but if you are the parent or guardian, you might approach that child uh, directly. Um, but in either case, um, whether it's a child or an adult, um, I think listening um, uh, when you approach that person and not making assumptions before you have that conversation with them. Um, you know, don't go into the conversation saying, I think you have an eating disorder. Um, you know, don't make that assumption. Um, it may well be something else that's happening and um, that's impacting that person's you know, food and exercise. Um, listen to what they have to say um, non-judgmentally um, and try not to use um, labels. Uh, so like I said, uh, don't uh, make those assumptions and assume that person has a particular type of eating disorder. Um, and ask that person what they want and what they would find helpful. Again, some of that will be different if, that, if they're a child. Um, the parent may have more say um, in terms of what they can and can't do. Um, but I think really asking them and hearing them out when they say what kind of help they would find helpful, uh, find useful, um, can be really, really valuable. Don't just it kind of impose something on them. Um, so for instance, for me, um, as an adult, I knew what I wanted was professional help. I didn't want too much involvement from family. And I, I've kind of kept it that way. I update them when I feel like there's something to update them on. Um, but otherwise, I kind of stick to my professional help. And that's, that's what works for me. It, different things will work for different people. But they wouldn't have known that unless I told them that. Um, you know, they would have known to kind of uh, not ask me too many questions about it unless I had said that. That's what I felt comfortable with. Um, I would uh, definitely recommend uh, the BEAT website uh, because they have some really helpful forums specifically for parents and guardians um, and family members. Um, so if you're really confused as to how to start that conversation or what to say, what not to say, especially with a child, um, they've got some really great tips and you can speak to other parents and guardians who are in similar situations because I know through the work that I do in the civil service there are so many parents who are really scared of what to say what not to say and as my aunt said you're kind of treading on eggshells you're worried about saying the wrong thing so be a really helpful and kind of guiding you through that process um and um yeah I think what I said in during the presentation about not making comments on that person's appearance is really, really important. I can't tell you how many times someone has said, 
you look healthier now. And I've gone home and had an absolute meltdown because to me that meant you've gained weight. Mm. Um, and that can, that's that been really, really triggering for me. Um, so focus on that per- how that person is feeling um, and not too much on their appearance and how it may have changed over time. Okay. Yeah, that's a lot an interesting of- one because most people thinking that would be thinking it's a compliment and it's not necessarily about weight, but perhaps, you know, about um um you looking a little bit more alive or you know um more glowing or something like that and uh, it, it's a difficult one isn't it i think people are a bit more sensitive to not mentioning about weight now although perhaps in the older generation not so much but uh, it does make you think sometimes when you have to say these things you know who you're speaking to yeah that's very true that's very very true um so i think if we if we a lot of the questions that are coming through are very similar to what we've been talking about in this panel discussion and so if we move on to the questions that are coming through from the audience if at any point you feel that you don't want to answer any of those questions questions or anything then please just feel free to say so um rajvi do you want to take on the first question please yeah um so um, I, I think um, um, someone's written here, um, how do you or would advise someone to navigate social sessions, uh, settings in relation to food or drink, especially if it isn't planned or a spontaneous situation? Um, I'm not sure if that question was specifically for someone who has an eating disorder or someone who, if you're supporting someone with an eating disorder. Yeah. Um, it's a difficult one because everyone experiences these situations differently. Mm. Um, if it's, if you find yourself in, if you find yourself in a situation where there's food and drink and you're not comfortable with it, it might be planned or even, it might be unplanned, it might be planned. Um, you might still experience anxiety. Um, I think if you have someone that you can confide in, someone that knows what you're experiencing, leaning on them can be really, really helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, so for instance, I might tell a friend, um, oh, there's calorie information on this menu at a restaurant. Please, can you read out some of the things that are on the menu without the calorie information okay. um, so that I don't have to look at it? Um, or please, can you ask the the, the staff at the, the restaurant um, for a, a a menu without a calorie information if they have one um so relying on you know an ally can be really really helpful um and they can kind of help you navigate that situation if you don't feel like you can on your own mm-hmm. um one of the things that we really encourage people to do especially in workplaces but it will be helpful in uh, kind of family gatherings and friends gatherings is um putting food and drink in one place um and rather than scattering it around everywhere um because if that person knows that it's in one place and they find it triggering they can avoid that area if it's everywhere it's harder to do that um so that can be one way um to navigate that anxiety um i think going back to leaning on allies um as well as them helping you with kind of calorie information and that kind of thing um if you find yourself feeling triggered you could maybe um lean on them to change the conversation um, and move the conversation along um you could step outside um either with them or without them to get a breather and maybe talk to someone that you feel comfortable talking to and kind of manage that anxiety um i think the important thing is if you find yourself in a triggering com- in a triggering situation don't force yourself to be there remove yourself from that situation and do what you think is best for your own well-being Okay, um, so going on from there, I think one of the questions is um, around children. Um, so as we know, children are fussy eaters. Uh, those can be telltale signs or there can be nothing to it and they can just be in that developmental stage of a child. What can, what does a parent or a guardian look out for when they see, and you know, if they see that the child is a fussy eater, are they more likely to develop eating disorders as they go into adulthood? Um, I don't know if they're necessarily more likely to. 
Um, you know, you could have someone who's not a fussy eater or wasn't a fussy eater at all and then develop an eating disorder or someone who was a fussy eater like myself. I was a very, very fussy eater growing up. Um, and then I went on to develop an eating disorder. I don't know if there is necessarily correlation between the two, but I am not a mental health professional or medical professional. So um, I, I, it's, I can't really say either way um, whether someone is more or less likely to, to develop an eating disorder. Um, it is difficult uh, to not make assumptions and not panic. Um, and I think Jotha Wanti, you might be able to say a bit more from a parent's perspective and kind of seeing some signs but and kind of jumping to a conclusion as to whether it is something or isn't. Yeah, it, it's, it is very difficult. I, I do have a son who still is quite a fussy eater, um, but uh, you know, it doesn't struggle as far as we know. He might be about to tell me otherwise, but um, it doesn't struggle with, uh, with this topic. Um, I think... Uh, yeah, I'm trying to to think what what you would look out for. I think Rina, you had a slide which showed some of the symptoms to look out for, uh, and I assume the slides will be made available after the webinar. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm not. I I don't. I'm not sure that you can um, look for anything specific with fussy eaters. I I don't. In my <laughs> opinion that I don't think there is some connection um, between the two because fussy eating can be a result of you know problems with um, textures and, and tastes uh, it can be also due to allergies uh, as my son experiences um, allergies um, so you can be super tasters for example um, which uh, which is nothing not to do with you know eating disorders that we're talking about today so there may be other reasons and I would say that if I was in that situation I would speak with a medical professional um, to, to understand you know what things it could be and then figure out how you might go about trying to narrow it down. Yeah I think there are so many different symptoms that someone could experience and such a wide range from you know mental to behavioral to physical, um, being a fussy eater could, is just potentially one of many different symptoms. Um, so it's important not to jump to conclusions. It, like my aunt said, it could be a variety of different things, but I think if you are noticing a few different symptoms, then it is best to get advice from a, a professional who will help you to kind of identify what it is or isn't. Mm. Uh, thanks, Rina. And just um, following on from that, um, uh, at what point did you feel, so this is a question from uh, someone who's who's viewing in, at what point did you feel you needed to turn to therapy or seeking professional help? Um, so I, I saw a therapist uh, when I was a teenager uh, through the NHS. Um, that was through a service called CAMS, which people who... Um, live in I don't know if it's just a London service or um UK wide um you might be familiar with that um that wasn't necessarily help that I wanted um it was more kind of imposed on me um and we had we also had some family sessions through that my parents had uh, some of their own sessions too um but I it definitely didn't work for me because I didn't want to be there I didn't want that help I wasn't ready for it um I just wanted to be left alone with the eating disorder um, I then got help again voluntarily when I was at university through the university service. And that was probably the first time I actually wanted to get better. Um, I had, I'd had nothing left in me. Um, I had had an eating disorder for such a long time at that point, And I was in such a bad state, especially during my second year of university, that I had nothing left to give it. And I knew I needed help. Mm -hmm. Um and I think that's when my recovery started. And then I relapsed again when I was, uh, so in 2019, and then I went straight to my GP and said, "I this is happening all over again. Um, can you get me onto the waiting list? Mm -hmm. And the waiting list was very long, uh, which I know is that's, that's something that a lot of people experience. So, I mean, I'm privileged enough that I can get private therapy. Um, it's not affordable or accessible for everyone. Um, mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that you can't access 
other types of help which will be either more affordable or you know completely free um and that's why i would definitely encourage people to go through the beat website because they have a whole directory um, on how to get support I, I just want to follow up on that because you mentioned that the initial cams referral when you're a teenager you weren't ready for it um do you think it it made a difference to your family to go through it though do you think it was of value to them um i mean i, I probably shouldn't speak for them but, oh, I, fair I, enough. Um, yeah. but, but I i think this is just from what i saw um and heard i think it helped them to understand a bit more because they were hearing it from a, an objective professional Mm. Um, I don't think I would have been able to explain what was happening to me uh, to them um, or at least not in a way that they would have been able to understand um, but I think also they got guidance from the therapists on um, how to tackle certain situations uh, certain behaviors that I had picked up which were really harmful to me um, and how to kind of stop me from continuing to engage in those harmful behaviors um, so I think they probably uh, had a bit more control over the situation because of the, that guidance that they got. Yeah, thanks. Whilst we're talking about family members, I think one of the questions is what made you reach out to a family member? You know, youngsters try not to, you know, they don't want their family to know. Um, it's something you said. What made you reach out to a family member, uh, be it uh, your aunt, Jyoti Ben? Uh, and what qualities? Do you, did you look for when you were reaching out to family, you know, in that supportive system? Um, I mean, I don't think I voluntarily really and truly reached out to a family member or spoke openly about what I was experiencing until I was an adult. I think any conversations that were had with family when I was still a child were not conversations that I necessarily wanted to have um, because, like I said, it was it felt like me against the world. I was in this eating disorder bubble and I didn't want anyone else to be near me or the eating disorder. I was very protective over it and it, it was protective of me. Um, so I don't think it was I, until I was an adult that I started voluntarily speaking about these things with family members. And I think one of the people I've spoken to about it is my aunt, um, at times my brother as well. Um, and I think... The reason why I've gravitated towards my aunt and my brother probably more than others, um, I probably still don't do it enough, but the few times where I have spoken about it is because they both have quite similar personality traits in that they're both very level-headed. Um, how we're related, I don't know. <laughs> um, but um, they're both quite pragmatic and they just listen non-judgmentally. Um, and... Um, yeah, I, I just don't feel judged in those situations. Um, and it's, um, I don't feel like I have to um, be a certain type of person to please them. Um, I feel like I can just be Rena when I'm having those conversations. I don't have to be Little Miss Perfect um, when I'm having those conversations and pretend to be something I'm not. Um, but I think knowing that I'm not going to be judged is probably um, what has pushed me to speak to them. Um, yeah, and I think that I think that's really important. Just just listen to each other. Um, don't judge each other. Um, and yeah, I think that's probably it. Um, I've got another um, uh question here so it touched on something you said at the beginning uh Rina that you mentioned uh, eating disorders can stem from trauma or depression or anxiety um and and did you manage to find your route and was that helpful in your recovery yeah I mean I'm I'd say I'm, I'm still figuring that out um you know four and a half years in therapy it's still um it's a never-ending process really trying to get better whether you have an eating disorder or you're just trying to work on other things mm. um it honestly some of it depends on the kind of therapy you get um so there are lots of different types of therapists out there different types of therapies that you could um get 
you can access. The one that I have had or continue to have is called um, cognitive analytical therapy, um, which is more about kind of delving into your past and trying to understand why you are the way that you are, why you think the way that you think. And that means going really back in time to when you were a childhood, sometimes even a toddler, even if you can't really remember much. Um, and that helps you to kind of uncover a lot of things that you might have experienced that you might not even be aware of. You might have pushed back to the back of your mind. Um, so that's been really helpful for me. Different types of therapies will will benefit people in different ways, uh, but that's definitely what's been helpful for me. But it's um, it's a process. It takes a long time. You know, there's no quick fix, um, especially if you have that kind of therapy where you have to spend a lot of time trying to understand things before you can even think about how to work through things and get better. Um, so you have to be really patient. Um, I think also what's been really helpful in my therapy, one of the first things my therapist said to me, who's an eating disorder specialist, um, was, I think it was in my first session with her a few years ago, she said, we're going to talk about this eating disorder. We're not going to forget about it, we're, but we're, we're not going to speak about it all the time. And I couldn't get my head around that initially because I thought, surely this is why I'm here. <laughs> surely this is the one thing we should be talking about. Why are we talking about anything else? Mm. Um, but what she meant was for such a long time, I had been consumed by this eating disorder. Mm. I was in this bubble and my life evolved around it. And it was the biggest part of my, identi my identity. I didn't really know Rena without an eating disorder. And what she wanted me to do was try and understand Rena aside from the eating disorder you know, it's it's a part of me, but it's not all of me. And there are all these other parts of Rena that some of, uh, lots of other issues that I needed to uh, work through, but also lots of wonderful things that I hadn't yet embraced. Mm -hmm. um, so I think remembering that you're not in this bubble and um, that your eating disorder isn't everything is really, really important. And I know that's big, been a big part of my therapy. That's cool. So I think coming now to, we've talked about family, close family and professional health and things like that. One of the top topics that's coming through is around the community, right? Around the social settings. Um, somebody ha is uh, mentioned about their own personal journey. Um, say you are, your body image, you're very conscious of your body image, but you also have certain disabilities or something that may not allow you to do much about, you know, exercising or anything of that sort. And if you're out in a social setting and say you picked up a biscuit, for example, and somebody makes a comment about your, 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 your physical being, how do you mentally block those comments? How do you overcome what you feel at that point? And how do you stop yourself um, from eating in private in that case you know for when you want to treat or anything like that yeah it's a, it's a really difficult one and i i don't have any disabilities myself so it's it's difficult for me to um to truly understand what that person has experienced um but i do think setting boundaries like we, we spoke about earlier is really important um, even if it's, you know, a, a one-off comment that this person has never made before, it's a, maybe it's a brand new person, you don't really know them, whatever the case may be, but responding um, and setting those boundaries, I think is really important and telling that person that actually, one, that comment isn't appropriate because they don't know what you're going through, um, but two, it's not really any anyone's business um, and you know, quite often people make these comments because they are dealing with insecurities of their own. Um, and um, so I think setting those boundaries with people and responding in that moment is really important or encouraging an ally to do that on your behalf if you don't feel comfortable doing it yourself. Um, it can be really difficult to, you know, I wouldn't necessarily encourage someone to block it off. I think uh, processing the comment that someone has made and how it's made you feel is really, really important. Because I think if you don't process it, it will stick with you and it will kind of come back to bite you in the ass later on. Um, so finding a way to process what has happened, whether it's with a, a mental health professional or someone that you're close to and you trust is really, really important um, because that will help you to kind of deal with it and move on from it. Um, 
Eating in private is definitely something that I have experienced a lot, um, especially as um, a teenager or when I was at university, um, because you do feel that shame about eating in front of other people. You're worried about what other people will say and think. Um, so there were loads of times where I ate in private, um, either at late at night or at times, uh, you know, I would lock myself in the bathroom at uh at school uh because i didn't want anyone to see me eat lunch um honestly in in if you're experiencing some like something like that my my advice is to get uh to seek out uh, professional help um i don't think there's necessarily a quick fix to that um i think getting uh help from a medical professional or mental health professional is the most valuable thing you can do um in that in that situation Uh, thank you, Rina. Um, we've had another uh, personal story. I won't go into too many details, but uh, it's it's coming from concern. And perhaps Jyoti Ben, you can you know pip, um, jump in here. Rina, you had mentioned that really the it, when you were ready it, um, for the help, it, that's when it was the most effective. Now, if you have a situation of, of parents of an adult where um, they have an anorexia, but they don't seem to be responding and they are not, um, let's say, purely on a liquid diet for many years. And although they are getting lots of help, obviously, it's very worrying to parents to see that that is not changing. Um, is there a limit to how much other people can do? Um, is there more that they can do that, you know, they're seeing the GP, they're, you know, they're seeing specialists, there's therapists involved? ultimately what can those parents do where, where can they obviously they feel helpless so Jyoti Ben do you have any advice is it just a matter of patience and yes and unfortunately um, you cannot make them want to get better ultimately the change has to come from within mm. but what you can do as a family member or, or somebody in a supportive role is to create a, a safe, non-judgmental, calm environment so that they feel able to work on this. And yeah, yeah that uh, in my uh, in my experience, I, I don't think that if, if if somebody doesn't want help that you can, make it happen for them it has to come from from the person ultimately mm -hmm. um, but you can get yourself educated if 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 they won't seek help or uh, or things are not changing fast enough you can ask for different opinions you can get yourself educated to to see if you can support them better mm -hmm. um, and yeah. is there are there support groups for the families of people going through this because it seems to me it's a huge mental burden for them as well especially if they feel a bit helpless I'm sure there are now and Rena can comment on it but at the time we were going through it um, I, I'm not aware of very many things that existed if there were we weren't aware of them yeah so I think the the charity beat uh, which I've men mentioned earlier they have um, a forum specifically for family members um, who are in that situation. And it's not just about um, how can you help the person you're worried about, but it's also about how you can help yourself and look after your own well-being. Because like you said, Rajvi, the burden um, and the impact that it has on a family members or friend or colleagues' uh, mental health can be quite significant. And, and you your focus... Is it B-E-A-T? Is that how it's spelled? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, right. Okay, we'll try and get that uh, link up on the chat as well. Thank you. I think the um, the focus is quite often on the person who's directly impacted by the mental health issue. And in that, in the process of looking after them, you forget about yourself. I'm not a parent myself, but I know from other, what other people have mm -hmm. said, um, that's the case. Um, so I really want to kind of underline how important it is for a family member who's in that supporting role or friend or whoever it is to also look after their own well-being because it's just as important don't forget about yourself in that situation um and i also want to reiterate um 
how important it is for men to get help as well. I think quite often when we have these conversations, we talk about the impact on mothers and we forget about the impact on fathers or brothers um, or just, you know, males in your life. Um, and the stigma associated with them talking about their mental health is so, so difficult. It's, it's, it's so big that um, there's this pressure to kind of suck it up and be brave and, pretend mm. to be okay when actually males are absolutely affected by eating disorders both directly and indirectly too that's very true very very true i think it's the personality of men right um as you just mentioned um they and they don't easily reach out for help as well um and i think there's something else around social media you know and coming to uh body image, disordered eating. I think a lot of the disordered eating, certain sort of circumstances in life can make you do that, uh, put you into acute phases. Uh, it could be grief or anything like that. And you start noticing yourself a little bit more in that situation. And in the age of social media, there's a, you know we're surrounded by so much of information, misinformation online at the touch of a button. And there's so many things, you know, you hear about keto, you hear about paleo, you hear about intermittent fasting. Uh, there's a question as to, it can become very confusing and overwhelming for people when they see all of these. They don't, they are trying to understand what's happening to them as well at the same time. How do you navigate this mass of information, misinformation that you see, you know, straight away? Yeah, I think it's a good question. I think most people are aware of how much misinformation there is these days. You know, it's uh, on the tip of everyone's tongue. There's always a lot of crap out there, to be honest. Um, I know what works for me is uh, taking time away from social media, whether it's deactivating my accounts or uh, muting certain accounts, unfollowing things that I think are triggering um, because it's just not worth uh, seeing such a negative impact on your own mental health. I know my friends, uh, my friends who know me very well know that I regularly deactivate my account on Instagram or I, I won't post things for years sometimes because I know the impact that it will have on my own well-being. Um, you might also find it helpful to, you know, mute WhatsApp conversations or, you know, not respond to people who are saying triggering things or sharing information about diets. Um, I think in our community, there's a lot of WhatsApp forwards, um, which uh, have a lot of misinformation, which can be really, really harmful. Um, so either don't download it or tell that person to stop sending you things, delete it straight away, whatever you think is helpful for you to stay focused on what's healthy for you. Um, mm -hmm. Healthy means different things for different people. Um, there's no one definition for it. Um, and I think it's worth finding out what that word means for you as an individual, for your body, for your mind, um, whether you need to work with a mental health professional to get to that place or a medical professional. Figure out what healthy means for you and try and stay focused on that and don't worry about what healthy means for other people. Um, there was a... Marshall, can we have the last question? Okay, yeah. So... Um... Um, a comment from uh, uh, someone here saying that they've found your talk really interesting, very eye-opening and educational. Um, and they've asked that you mentioned a toolkit you developed. And they're asking, is that something available online or has the potential to be? And are there any other sources? So the toolkit that I mentioned is one that we created within the civil service. Um, so it's only accessible to civil servants. Um, I'm going to be leaving the civil service soon <laughs> um, and going on a career break. Um, so I do want to create a sim similar version for kind of non-civil servants. Um, mm. So stay tuned. Um, but I would definitely recommend the Beat website again. Um, I don't work for them. <laughs> I know I keep um, talking yeah, about them, but we did collaborate with them actually for the civil service toolkit. Um, mm -hmm. And um, a lot of the information that we've used um, has come from them. Um, so they have pretty much everything that you will need on understanding eating disorders, but also how to get support, how to navigate social situations. Um, but also there's a whole section for um, carers as well. OK, great. Thank you so much. Um, I think we now come to the end of our session. Uh, uh, Bunam, I don't know if you want to say something before I say my thanks. 
No, please go for it. Okay. Um, All right. It's been really great. So, um, thank a huge thank you uh, to our speakers, Rina Gutka and Jyoti Dodia. Um, this is one of those subjects that you say affects so many people. It's still a taboo subject and something that people struggle with silently on their own, even within their family. So, thank you so much for providing such a wealth of information and giving your personal stories. I think it'll be really helpful um, to everyone. Um, I'd also like to thank our technical team, which at the moment is Kilit, uh, who's do doing the uh, website and the YouTube. Thank you so much for Kilit Shah. Thank you to our audience for joining today. Um, and we really hope you found it useful. This has been recorded. It will be available um, on our Oshawa YouTube channel and also via our website on the health pages. So if there's anyone that you know that you feel would be benefit to them to watch this video, please share it with them. I think we'll also put a link later on Facebook as well, Bunam, and potentially on our social media as well. So look out for that. And yes. we will have more webinars coming up in this series. So do watch out for all the messaging on that. Um, and on behalf of all of us, um, I'd like to wish everyone a Jay Jinendra and a very good evening. Jay Jinendra, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Oh,